Good morning, everybody, and Merry Christmas. So one of my pet peeves of this season is that the 12 days of Christmas begin on Christmas Day. So we are in the second of 12 days of Christmas. And I know this is a hill, I will, a battle I will not win. The world has moved on and does not follow the liturgical seasons in the way maybe it once did. But for this morning, at least, it is the second day of Christmas and we get to linger in some of our Christmas favorites, some songs, some stories, some prose, and a little bit of history for a little bit longer. So welcome all of you. I am so glad you are here to continue the celebration with me today, with me and my family. So come let us gather, come let us worship together. And I am Chris Mesroche, and I am the Sunday Service Coordinator, and I'm speaking to you from my uh, home in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And we would like to thank, uh, we would like to welcome, I should say, all of the Unitarian churches that are here with us. The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Grand Traverse, located in Traverse City, Michigan. We would like to welcome the Unitarian Universalist, Universalist Congregation of Petoskey, located in Petoskey, Michigan. We would like to welcome everybody from the Unitarian Universalist Church in Tippecanoe County, located in West Lafayette, Indiana, and the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg, located in Harrisburg, PA. Um, we are imagining our household just filled up with um, all of you and we're um, hoping we can refresh your drinks and we're hoping the snacks are staying warm, but we're so happy to have all of you here with us. So the way we have crafted our service today is that every element is a gift to us all. And that means we have presents to unwrap. So now I invite Michelle to unwrap a present and share it with us. Bye. Hi everyone. Fabulous reused packaging, my favorite. Now we have the chalice lighting. Sweet. Oh, there it is. There's a picture of our wonderful church. <laughs> All righty. Well, now I can officially say that today's chalice words come from Christine Robinson. She says, we gather this hour as people of faith with joys, sorrows, gifts, and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. And one of our traditions that we have at People's Church that we invite you to do is uh, if you are lighting a candle, if you're lighting a chalice uh, in your own home, uh, we invite you to share in the chat where you are lighting it from. You can either tell us the neighborhood, you can tell us the city, you can tell us what part of the city. Um, there's a broad interpretation of that. You can tell us from what state of mind you're uh, lighting the chalice from. So then, Rachel, does that mean it's time for another gift? So my child, DeForest, is going to help us with some unwrapping this morning. Oh. I know, right? OK, what's in there? What do we have in here? Oh. No, can I read it? Are you going to read it? Okay. It is time for joys, joys and sorrows. Ritual. Ritual. Okay. So at People's Church, mm -hmm. when we share our joys and sorrows, we place stones in a bowl of water. 
it is a way. Are you going to do that for us? Can I move that closer? Sure. <laughs> so we have a bowl of water right here, and we place stones in our bowl of water as a way to share how each joy or sorrow or milestone in our community affects us all, and to remember that we are held by something larger than any one of us when we are living with challenges. So it is our practice to invite people who want to share joys and sorrows to write them in the chat. We will pause our recording. And now it is time for our next present. Oh, no, it's not. I know, but can you read the card? The Unitarians in the History of Christmas, told by Chris Mazaros. And there's nothing. That, that's it. That's all we need. <laughs> well, I am the very Chris Messers that was spoken of, and uh, so a lot of the information that I am um, basing my uh, high, so I'm the Chris Messers that was bespoken of, and a lot of the information that I'm, uh, be, I'll be sharing with you, I've gotten out of a book called uh, The Battle for Christmas. And um, so to start out to kind of know how the Unitarians um, uh, had in the year of 1817, um, a very big campaign um, for, uh, for changing the role of Christmas, you first have to kind of understand in America what Christmas was and why it was. Um, and to kind of understand that, you have to kind of look at what Christmas was in um, kind of Europe, like kind of Northern Europe and where a lot of the people, the white people uh, who came to America were, you know, kind of what their tradition was. So the Christmas was kind of this period um, in between. So first of all, the harvest, if you were uh, uh, an average citizen, the harvest was done. And um, so there wasn't a lot of work to do on your farm. And then also um, any alcohol that you would put up was coming into um, was, was actually coming to be something you could drink. And originally, um, when these things started, um, there was no such thing as a cork. So you had to drink it as soon as you had it. Also, that start of uh, December, that was the period where you could do, um, there was a great period of slaughtering animals because only in those winter months in Northern Europe could you actually store that meat and be able to have that all winter. It wasn't really safe um, up until that point. So you've got people who are sitting around with alcohol. They're sitting around with a lot of animals that they've killed and there's not a lot else to do. So they wound up doing a lot of drinking. And so th that whole season became a time of uh, of kind of great drinking and of, of plenty. And you also have to understand this in a period where um, it was not a period of plenty. It wasn't like people could just go down to the store and get things. You know, people had, um, it was a time of great scarcity for a lot of the year. So this time of plenty was like, whoa, it was, it was this, this abundance. And um, that became something that, uh, that you had. So then out of that, of course, um, came the tradition of, um, you know, came the, the kind of compromise that Christianity did with paganism, where Christianity said, okay, we see that you've got this, uh, this um, you know, you've, you've got your solstice here, we'll put this, we'll put Christmas on the solstice, if you can kind of keep doing a lot of the same things that you've been doing, you know, you can have the tree, you can, you know, do a lot of the light celebrations that you've done. Um, but then there's just this Jesus Christ that's added to it, which kind of reminds me of when I went to, um, to Ireland, there were crosses there, the, you know, the Irish cross is famous for in the middle where the, the two, uh, the two uh, straight lines come together, there's a circle, and it was a way of the Christians co-opting the, um, 
uh, the, the Irish religion at the time of, of worshiping the sun is a way of saying, well, well, here's your sun. It's just inside this cross. And so I, I see, I think of it as being kind of, it's still the same tradition, but it has this Christian veneer to it. Um, so um, that kind of continues up until the point where the Puritans come along and the Puritans rightly say, now, hey, wait a second, this Christmas, it does not come, the, the Bible never actually says when Christmas is. And they look and they see that a lot of very un-Christian-like, un-Puritan behavior is being condoned under the guise of Christmas. And they put a stop to it in, for the brief period that they're kind of in charge of uh, what they're in charge of in, in England. And then certainly when they come over to America, they put the kibosh on all of that. In, um, uh, 18, in 1659, they literally pass a law that uh, charges you five shillings for doing anything uh, for celebrate for any celebration of Christmas that resembles the celebration of Christmas that occurs in England. And um, and that continues, and the, the Puritans do a very nice job keeping a lid on things for a very, very long time. But of course, there's always, it, it's always ready to seep out. You know, it's, there's, there's always these, these stories of, um, you know, groups of mummers, you know, groups of mummers for people who would um, dress up in, in outrageous costumes. When women would dress as men, men would dress as women. Poor people would go and they dress in the, the guise of very rich people and they they take on the affect and they would almost satire the rich. And they would go into people's houses and they would basically say, you know, we're here, this is the Christmas time. We demand you give us the best meat that you have and the best beer or the best alcohol that you have. And uh, we know a lot of this from um, it's uh, history in songs like Here We Come a Wassailing, you know, with verses like, um, we are not just daily beggars that beg from door to door, but we are your neighbor's children whom you have seen before. But there's also more cryptic versions of the same, uh, the same kind of idea. So for example, there is a, uh, um, there's a Gloucester wassail that has lyrics, come butler, draw us the best draw us the bowl of your best, like a, a cup of your best alcohol. Then we hope your soul in heaven shall rest. But if you draw us a bowl of the small, then down will come butler, bowl and all. So there's always a little bit of an aggressive tone to it. And this continues in many parts of New England. And uh, so, um, so then here come in the Unitarians. So here's something that I just find amazing to think about. In the first decade in um, Boston town, the Unitarians and the Universalists have such a religious lock on the city that within the bounds of, uh, of the city, you cannot find a Trinitarian church. You cannot find a traditional Father, Son, and Holy Ghost church. And um, so the Unitarians see this and they see the, there are these groups of young men called the Antics. And the antics are people basically go around mummering, but because they're so disguised, nobody can you know, really figure out who they are and they're causing problems. And so the Unitarians say, well, we will do a two-pronged attack on this. First of all, let's try to make Christmas a religious holiday. And so they open up the churches on Christmas to try to encourage people to come in, but then they also, um, they pass around this note uh, that basically says, okay, if you sign this note and you're living with, and you're a business within Boston, you're agreeing that if most of the, uh, if most of the businesses in, in Boston also sign this note, you'll be closed Christmas morning. And they get it, they do it. They get um, seven out of eight uh, business people um, agree to this. And there are reports of people coming into the Boston area to buy and sell things who say, basically, we couldn't buy and sell anything because every, all the shops were closed. And um, this continues for about two or three years. And then very slowly, uh, it kind of creeps back. There's a, wonderful, uh, uh, there's a wonderful turn of phrase that, um, that, is, in one of the, uh, that is in one of the newspapers. Um, so first of all, the newspaper reports uh, uh, 
expresses its pleasure that, quote, no law, civil or divine, actually required the observance of the feast of the papal and Episcopal churches. Um, and, but then they go on to say that they deplore the fact that Boston's businessmen feel unable to pursue their occupations openly. So uh, a lot of the public tide begins to turn away from this until finally, um, a couple of years later, in, um, so it started in 1817, so that by 1820, a religious magazine in Boston um, assaulted the idea of making a Christmas a public holiday, but its argument had nothing to do with the theology um, or the deity of Christ's birth. The magazine acknowledges uh, that December 25th was, quote, a time of rejoicing and religious ceremonies for many Christian, but that the problem lay with other kinds of behavior, um, uh, but that basically there's such an immense joy in celebrating the holiday in kind of this, this unceremonious way that basically the argument is, why should we stop people from doing this? And so by um, 1820, the, the turn of the phrase is that um, uh, the Boston Statesman says with regret, few places of business were closed yesterday, um, but, uh, but none of the churches of Episcopal order we believe were to be opened. So uh, they were regretting the fact that um, uh, things kind of went back to where they were, mostly because people didn't want to celebrate Christmas um, that way. And it was said that shops would be would look closed, but if you push the door, you could actually go in and you could actually do business. And um, so turning the holiday into something that it, what it looks like right now didn't happen, really didn't happen until a few years later with the invention of Santa Claus. But that is not this story to tell. Um, that might be a story for another time. But uh, so that is the history. And in closing, I think I'd like to read something that, um, eh, something that I've been looking to a lot this year. So it's the words of uh, the writer Sarah Marshall, who um, in talking about Christmas, says Christmas has always been defined by nostalgia. Christmas is tradition, it's a ritual. We need to do it. It's, it's nice to do the same things in some capacity throughout the years. Something you do annually because you notice another year has passed and you are now doing them the same things that you were doing the last time this year. Yes, it is about seeing people and reconnecting with your family, but part of it is also about noticing that time has passed and relating to the seasons of your life. life. Christmas is something that encourages us to be as deeply nostalgic as we crave to be all the time. We define a good Christmas by, is it familiar? Have we done it before? And I think this in essence is probably the thing that killed um, the religious, the religiousity, the, trying to make Christmas religious is that it just wasn't something that people did before. And it took coming up with something stronger to replace that. And now I think it's time for another present. Thank you, Chris. Forrest, are you ready for another present? Yeah. Okay, what's in this one? That's like a pizza box. I don't think it's a pizza. Wait, it looks like. Yeah. Let me help. Oh, I did it. Yeah. Eek. Okay. What does it say? Oh, Christmas tree performed by Jake Krause.
Oh, come all ye faithful, performed by Eliza Krauss. My child has lost interest, so now I get to do the unwrapping. It's not as fun when it's not toys inside. Next is a reading from All I Really Want by Quinn G. Caldwell. And that is mine to read. Quinn G. Caldwell is a United Church of Christ pastor, and he writes, poor Joseph, he gets engaged and then suddenly finds out he's been cheated on, whether by another guy or God hardly matters, and his wife is pregnant. He tries to do the right thing and leave her quietly. But then he gets bullied by an angel even to, into doing an even righter thing. He marries and cares for Mary, adopts Jesus and makes him his own. All this, and he barely gets a mention in the Bible. How many hymns about Joseph do you know? Would you even notice if the figure of Joseph went missing from your nativity scene? I mean, half the time you can't even remember which one is Joseph and which is the shepherd. He deserves better. In the Middle Ages, they had a special Latin title for him, Nutritor Domini. It means feeder of the Lord. In one sense, this just meant that he was the family's provider, the one who brought home the bacon. Well, not bacon, they were Jewish but you know what I mean. In another sense, Nutritor Domini is much more tender and intimate the title. Nutritor is an uncommon word. It is the male form of Nutrix. And you know what a Nutrix was? A wet nurse. 
or one who breastfed a baby when the baby's biological mother couldn't or wouldn't do it herself. In calling Joseph Nutritor Domini, they were implying that Joseph's care was as gentle and as loving as breastfeeding. They were saying that he was the one who stood in for the parent, the one who made Jesus eat his broccoli, argued with him about sugary cereals, gave him his goldfish crackers and juice boxes and cheese sticks. He didn't have to do it. He chose to. And then look what happened. When God was born into the world, tiny, squalling, and helpless, Joseph could have walked away. Instead, he picked the baby up, shuffled out to the kitchen in the dark, and started heating up a bottle. Okay. <laughs> the Christmas the Christians and the Pagans by Dar Williams, performed by Susan Lordyke. Christmas is always special, every song, every time. Merry Christmas.
So our next present is The Story of the Stolen Infant by Carl Scoville. This is a story by a, a minister who served King's Chapel, one of those old Boston churches for over 30 years. And Chris has our story. All right. The Stolen Infant by Carl Stovall. I like to think that after many years of living together, our family has developed a certain sense of equilibrium, a certain ease with each other. From time to time, of course, differences arise and sometimes and occasionally an act of outright rebellion. But as the reigning benevolent despot of the King's Chapel Parsonage at 63 Beacon Street, I like to think that by and large, we get on very well. I don't pretend that all differences are resolved. For example, we have not yet come to complete agreement on just how warm a house should be. I grew up in a house without, a certain, without central heating, and I've always felt that a cool house is a healthy house, and previous to colds and conductive to the flow of blood. My daughters do not share that sentiment and at times become articulate upon that point. Last Christmas, when I refused to turn up the heat sufficiently high to raise a winter supplies of orchids, our youngest daughter declared, behold, a decree went out to Carl Augustus that all the world shall be frozen, and each went to her own room to be frozen. Nonsense, I returned. You are much better off here than you were living in Russia or China. I don't recall her precise response, but something in her tone a voice suggested that she was not convinced and my word was not final. That Christmas Eve, we had our traditional service of songs and scripture, but I added a small new feature. On the old communion table, we had placed a crescia terracotta fig. We had cr placed a crescia terracotta figures of Mary, Joseph, and the child cradled in its mother's arms, shepherds, sheep, and King's as well. We had never had a crèche at the King's Chapel before, and I wasn't sure how the people would take it. I hoped that the, the muted colors of these terracotta figures might soften any Puritan objections. We went through the family service at 4.30, Holy Communion at 6, and the big service at 10.30 p.m., and I heard nothing but words of appreciation. I was relieved and thought perhaps we'd start a new tradition. I had finished greeting the crowd after the late service when our verger approached me with a worried look and said, I think you better come down to the chancel. Why, what is the matter, Tom? I asked. One of the pieces of the crèche has been stolen. Which one, I asked? The Christ child, he answered. Oh Lord, I thought, here we put this out for the first time and ah, as we walked down the aisle of the church, I couldn't help wondering who would take such a piece, a drunk, a nut, an objector, a prankster. We got to the chapel and looked at the crèche and sure as shooting the baby was gone. I looked under the table and around the uh, channel floor, nothing. Then, Back to the crèche, I saw the edge of a tiny slip of paper protruding beneath the figure of Mary. I drew the paper out and found the following message printed neatly in pencil. We've got Jesus. Turn up the heat at 63 Beacon Street and you can have him back for the morning service. The heat went up at the parsonage. The infant reappeared and everything returned to normal. Well, not quite. The, the benevolent despot of 63 Beacon Street still sits less certainly upon his throne. That is probably not surprising. No monarch, indeed no despot, can ever be sure of his rule when his child has been born. Oh and I love the unicorn paper here. Uh -oh. Not too much tape. A card from Peoples. It's time for the offering and the offertory. <laughs> it is time for the offering and the offertory. So a reminder for all of you from all congregations that if you're someone for whom 
giving in a generous uh, giving in a particular calendar year makes a difference. I'm sure you are aware that 2021 is quickly nearing its end, and so if giving before the calendar year ends matters to you, you just have a few days to do that. And people's people are generous people in so many ways. One of the ways I am seeing that the most right now is in our work to resettle families from Afghanistan. We have been working with the two Jewish congregations in Kalamazoo to resettle two families and then helping with some other families as well because the needs are great. A few weeks ago, one of our lead, lead people in this work told me that we needed someone who speaks Pashto and English because our a family is a monolingual Pashto speakers. And most of the, most of the Af Afghans that we knew speak other languages and so couldn't help us with them. And so the call went out. We started posting on Facebook and saying, if you, if you don't know Pashto, share until we find someone who does. And within an hour, we had it identified a Pashto speaker in Paris who was going to help us. And within three hours, we had found someone locally who then by the next evening was at meeting our volunteers at the house of this family to help them navigate a brand new, entirely different life in Kalamazoo after living their lives up to this point in rural Afghanistan. It was an amazing reminder that we have the skills and the networks that we need to do incredible work right in front of us. And we see that again and again when people step forward with generosity, not knowing where the, the support might come from to carry us all the way we need to go, but trusting and moving forward in faith. So this is the point where I invite you to continue to be the generous people that you are and support the good and important work of People's Church, if you're a People's Church person, or the congregation that you are connected to as we gather all together. Please continue to be generous. The offering will now be received.
please join me in giving thanks for all that sustains us. From the countless gifts we each have been given, gifts of life and love and sustenance, we bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. And another present to unwrap. We have Deck the Halls performed by Owen Ellis and Jennifer Drake, the duo that we just got to hear. Wish you a Merry Christmas, performed by Ethan Semmelbauer. Okay. <laughs> it is now time for a Christmas prayer with seven words by Rebecca Parker. So I invite you to still your mind and your body for a moment of prayer. We remember the Magi, 
observers of stars, evidence-based speakers who found their way to kneel before a baby. May we too kneel before life's intricate mysteries following the path of science-based searchers for truth. We remember Mary, birth mother of a revolutionary prophet, the fetus in her womb a surprise, her choice a decision to magnify her hope. The birth difficult, attended by a beautiful diversity of animals and a ragtag gathering of vulnerable people. May we too kneel at the cradle of Earth's dreams for peace and dedicate ourselves to revolutionary love. We remember Joseph, unexpected father, who embraced the baby as his own, believing that every child has a God-given entitlement to love and care. May we too stand by the women and children and vulnerable people of this world when patriarchal privilege and power threaten their freedom and put their well being at risk. We remember the angels singing in a cold night to the overtaxed poor, promising peace and goodwill to all. May we echo their songs in acts of solidarity and justice for all souls, refugee souls, disabled souls, black souls, young souls, transgender souls. May we bring the bold holy movement to bring heaven to earth. May the morning star brighten our hope for a new day and may laughter strengthen all of our prayers. Amen. Hmm, I wonder what is inside. Let's hear a poem, Night Visions, by Jan Richardson. Merry Christmas. Night Visions. Wise women also came. The fire burned in their wombs long before they saw a the flaming star. They walked in shadows, trusting the path would open under the light of the moon. Wise women also came, seeking no directions, no permission from any king. They came by their own authority, their own desire, their own longing. They came in quiet, spreading no rumors, sparking no fear to lead to innocent slaughter to their sister Rachel's inconsolable lamentations. Wise women also came and they brought useful gifts, water for labor's washing, fire for illumination, a blanket for swaddling. Wise women also came, at least three of them, holding Mary in her labor crying out with her in the birth pangs, breathing ancient blessings into her ear. Wise women also came and they went by the way wise women always do, home a different way. In this season, may we see them, the wise ones who come bearing their gifts to us. They cloak themselves in garb that rarely draws attention, but they are there on the edge of the shadows, in the margins of our days, on the threshold of our awareness, 
offering what we most need. Give us eyes to see, to see them before they have left to go home some other way, before we glimpse their departing shadows edged in gold and smell their spiced perfume lingering behind them in the air. Another present. Now it is time for a story about the history of People's Church told by David Greenquist. The greatest memory I have about Christmas is in our old building downtown at People's Church. Roger Greeley, who was our minister at the time and who passed away recently, would dress up as Santa Claus and swing down from the story balcony onto the stage just like Tarzan and his wife Kay just couldn't bear to watch because she thought sure the ceiling would give way. It probably would have had we stayed in the building much longer because one day the state fire marshal came in and declared the building unsafe and needed to be torn down. I remember that Sunday school class I had by the teacher, whom I only remember as Mrs. Zunica, told us the bad news about the building and had to be torn down. The reaction among the children in the class was not happy, and some even cried because they knew Santa wouldn't be swinging down from the balcony anymore. So we went to our interim home, which was then the West Main School. The biggest question was, how was Santa going to make his spectacular entrance? He ended up popping in from under the stage. And when we finally moved to our present location, again, the question was asked about how Santa would enter. It was finally decided that a rope would be lowered from what was the AV loft at the time, and Santa would climb down from it. This was okay, but to be honest with you, it wasn't nearly as spectacular as swinging down from a balcony. Roger taught me a lot of other things, like standing up for what you believe in, no matter what the cost. He also taught me how to lighten up. I have never known a bigger character than Roger. Much of the silliness I display in church, I learned from Roger. He was a mentor to me. But the biggest quote from him that I have always followed and still do to this day is, the time to be happy is now. The place to be happy is here. And the way to be happy is to make others feel such. We have one final present to open today and that is to be opened by Savannah, our music director who put up with this crazy scheme for a service and has pivoted beautifully the whole morning. Good morning. Here's our final present. The card says, Firelight, written and performed by Dara Lacano and People Singers.
Thank you all for being with us this morning. As we close, I invite you in the next 10 days of Christmas tide, because Christmas doesn't have to be over unless you want it to be. 
to find the things that bring you joy and bring you peace. We don't need to just rush back into regular life at this moment, even if that might be the messages we are receiving. So linger with what gives you pleasure in this time. Go in peace and go in love. <laughs>